and I believe we are still going and we're live. Okay, good. So, hi everyone. I'm super excited today because we have a guest speaker, Sapan Parik, that will tell us more about uh, stuff that happens when you think about products, not only code. So not only about crafting better code, but also having the vision of a product and how can we still ship faster and still quality? Because many there is this untold myth that hey, you know, if you want to go fast, you need to go, you need to sacrifice quality, and that might be a myth. And uh, Sapan will tell us more. But um, from my part, I want also to welcome uh, the software craft people in India, the community that uh, actually is driven right by uh, by Incubate, for which Sapan works. So uh, hi from hi folks from India, you are pretty far away, pretty late in your time zone. So thanks for the effort for joining us here. Um, I will let the floor to Sapan, but I just want to point out that uh, the questions either put them in the chat or keep them for the end, and at the end we will have enough debates to cl try to clarify all the points. So without further ado, Sapan, thank you very much for taking the time and effort to prepare for today, and uh, yeah. The floor is yours. Thanks, thanks a lot, Victor. Thanks a lot. Uh, as you said, I'm I am uh, one of the co-founder of Incubite, as well as our software cast people in their community. Uh, feel free to uh, visit our website. We are always hiring. We are trying to hire even in Europe. And uh, here are our handles. Feel free to follow us. Uh, but moving on, I think Victor, if you could uh, stop sharing the screen, perfect. Um, I think what we wanted to talk about. Let me. So you know what we are a we are a perfect. Let's see. We are, we are at the Microsoft Teams shop. So I'm trying to figure out how to make myself uh, bigger on the video. Um, so I can I see myself. Yeah. I just did it and pinned you. Oh, perfect. Uh, for yourself. It seems so. Oh, it doesn't happen for everyone. Work. I see. No, I see. It. I'm pinned now. So cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So uh, I think first, Victor, thanks a lot for saying I, I had prepared a start of this uh, talk, but then you mentioned something about coding and coding. And I that reminds me of uh, this wonderful book called Software Engineering at Google. Uh, and it has like the very first one or two chapters that talks about the fact that what does it mean when you say you are developing or so what software engineering means? And is software like programming same as software development or software engineering or not? And I think that's where, uh, and you put it very well that uh, how the activity of just coding is quite different than doing the actual software development, right? And uh, that being said, I think that's what the today's talk is about. We're going to talk about how to launch your software faster and uh, there's no real shortcut. So there's, there's really no way that, where, where you can just do something like this and, and launch your software faster. But what we are going to talk about is that most companies believe that moving fast means we need to code fast. So like almost like hands on keyboard is what we are kind of measuring and not the other things, right? Uh, and the co common theme is that, hey, it's okay. We'll throw the bad work later and then do the good work, but it never happens, right? I think the reality is very different. You never throw something out. You call it experimentation. You call it low fidelity. You call it no matter what you call it. Once you start coding, the code you wrote someday stays there for a long amount of time, right? Uh, I'm sure you've heard about COBOL code, which has been living there uh, in different servers, right? So it stays there. Nobody's out there rebuilding it. And, and, um, we talk about fast, going fast, but what about going, we are going fast today when we are starting a project or a, or, or a new business or a small team is starting something new. What about moving fast tomorrow, next week, a month later, three months later, so a quarter or a year later, can you keep moving fast? That's another question that we want to answer. And what can we do to get there, right? And, and what is the, the, what do you say? What What is the definition of moving fast, right? And I think that's where I want to talk about uh, the paradox of speed, right? Um, a lot of time, and I think everyone may have heard this, uh, 
that that moving fast to go fast you have to go slow and what does that mean i'm going to talk about the definition of time itself we as software developers have gotten the definition of time quite wrong we think that spending time over here let me this is mirrored mode i'm going to okay so we think that spending time over here uh is moving fast so i'm developing 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 and if i do things faster over there that's fast and then everything else i kind of do it later or not do it or kind of haphazardly do it and and this is what happens if you are developing something and if you were diligent at the time of development if you find a bug on this area right here right if you found a bug right there you can actually fix it right away you can fix it you were doing let's say compilation error at the time of development something failed you fixed it uh, just imagine an error or a bug now it's not an error it's a bug that goes all the way to the build stage builds are known some places it takes builds minutes hours if you're working at one of those companies where builds are manual it may take actually a couple of days where a person makes a build right and uh, uh the, the bug that actually you let slip to the build through the build and now it you it's going to take you way more time to fix it and same if it goes to qa companies are known to have qa cycles of like months so if you if a qa finds a bug you fix it and they test it again now you're going to spend a month fixing it and production is the worst production is the worst right here right uh why because in worst case scenarios i have seen companies which has yearly release systems right so this release a product once a year and uh you won't believe it actually we are doing this survey so every time when we interview a person we actually ask them about the release cycles and it it's surprising how many people actually say that it's from a quarter to a year so there are companies out there who are not releasing that software for more than right so just imagine if now you were to find a bug when you're in production already what happens you are finding a bug you're fixing it and it may take you 3 months to get that uh, bug fixed to your uh, users right and uh, uh that means you have unhappy customers or you are running around always doing doing hot fixes and that brings me to the the next next point which is this is and the point that i was trying to make is very nicely kind of uh, uh, depicted over here that uh, when we are working when we start or whenever we are working we should do what's in the first column right over here we should work on the every different way or every different kinds of work right we we may be enhancing uh, capabilities we may be managing complexities unplanned work uh, innovation all of that if we don't do this a lot of companies and this is the current definition of moving fast a lot of unplanned work and add new capabilities just keep doing that over and over again and because a lot of people are doing what's in the second column this happens with them in a six months or a year's time, they're doing lots and lots of unplanned work. They are most of the time managing complexity. And then there's just this little sliver, just a little bit of time that they can give to enhancing existing capabilities. This not only ends up in unhappy customers, it ends up in unhappy teams, unhappy management, unhappy business. There's like total havoc, right? Nobody likes to be in this situation, the, the last third one, right? So uh uh that's what we are going to talk and while we do this i think we talked about the definition of time we talked about seeing ahead and trying to experiment and do all different spectrum of work but at the same time we want to talk about staying lean also right so sometimes you kind of introduce a process uh you call it an agile process and what you can do is you can google uh a jira kind of a, this is this is called jira's workflow right uh, I just Google and this is an image. I'm pretty sure this company may be calling themselves agile company, but look at the number of steps which are there for something to get done. So here on the top, the gray dot where you see it, I think that's where you create an issue when it is open and look at the number of transitions that one issue may go through. So while we want to do uh, introduce a certain processes or certain way of working, we are not in any way promoting working like a, 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 a working like that screenshot right very complex what we are trying to do is we want to this entire philosophy comes from toyota's lean management production system right where you think of an assembly line where software is being produced and you're continuously kind of 
queuing and and trying to fail fast as much as possible. Um, that being said, I think we're going to move to different different things that we're going to introduce today. What I'm planning to do is we're going to talk about build, deploy, and monitoring our systems. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of code demo. I'll walk them through, but this discussion is not really about lines of code. So I may actually use templates. I may get things in there just to show how or what should happen. The, the idea of this talk is to start a journey. This talk doesn't really at the end, doesn't give you everything that you need. It either gives you how like a, a framework in terms of how to work or what you should do when you're launching uh, a product and or you're launching a, a new project inside your existing uh, organization, right? So uh, while we will talk about these things, uh, I may, you may go uh, see me going a little bit faster. Victor, if you feel, please uh, stop me and ask me a question. If you feel that I went so fast over something, um, and I'm 100% sure actually uh, that if you have a question because of speed, then everyone has a question. They're just not asking. <laughs> so uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask me a question if I if it's a little bit too fast. Uh, but as I said, the goal is not really go through every line of code. I'm going to take something very simple, but talk about the philosophy of it. Um, that being said, I think the first thing is these fonts were supposed to be uh, bigger. But anyways, uh, what we have is what we do is uh, let's talk about the very first uh, step of feedback right outside of compilation error compilation error is way of feedback you're getting to know right there and then that something's not working and you need to fix it outside of compilation error the next step is how many tests can you write we do outside in tdd uh, the reason is that we want to test different levels of things the first circle over here says client the second one says controller and the third one says service these are the typical components of how our layered architecture looks like, right? So a client is something like a browser or Postman or, or curl that's making HTTP request to your controller that makes a request to your services. Um, and one of the reasons that we work like this is that the companies who want to move fast, if they try to do this later, they may never get to it, which means if they say that, hey, I'll write these tests later, it may never happen. So at Incubite, we're always doing outside in TDD, right? So if we pick a project and if we are running it, then it's always using outside in TDD. Uh, so let's now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of presentation mode, share my screen. And look at this, this uh, simple project. Really, it, uh, I have used Micronaut uh, framework, which has a Micronaut, something called Micronaut launcher. You can go there, you can launch, you can select multiple technologies and it will create like a simple example applications on the fly for you. Uh, this is a very simple controller. Anyone who has worked with uh, MVC framework, you usually have a URL. Uh, when you call it, it, it can call an endpoint and it kind of, you can say what, what it returns. So this is pretty much out of the box. When you create a Micronaut project, this is what it comes with, right? At this time, you may actually share your code on something like GitHub, right? Um, now, this is one of the biggest problem. As you start working with your project, a lot of people start using a system like GitHub as a glorified file sharing system. They really, it could have been Dropbox or Google Drive, right? Um, and again, I'm not sure how many of you, but to, to a degree that we have actually received zip files inside github so that i can unzip and see code which is inside the zip file right so uh based on how people are using it i think a lot of people may be just using it to store as a storage system maybe with the benefit added benefit of being able to version your files right but any uh version control system lately has way more functionality each one of them has something like workflows or pipelines where you can not only just store like store your code but do much more. So we are going to kind of talk about those steps as well. Uh, but let's talk about, we talked about writing test cases, right? And when you create a Micronaut application, it comes with this kind of like a, a test, simple test. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the frameworks, uh, one of the live template that I created uh, for this talk. And I'm going to go ahead and 
inject a HTTP client at this level. So my test case is micronaut test. I can simply inject a client that can make a call to this endpoint. And I have written a test case over here. I'm going to go ahead and make this a search day. And now I have a very simple endpoint that's saying, hey, if I call this endpoint with year 4000, then it should say it is true. Now, what is the reason why we, so we are, we are doing two levels of testing with an integration test. We're actually testing your network detail. And I'm not saying network detail, but integration detail, how you're going to go there and how you're going to get the data. But what you are also uh, missing is a unit test now, because what this is saying is this is good, right? It's telling us that, hey, no page found, which means there's no, this is a typical HTTP 404 error, right? It's telling you that, hey, I went to the endpoint, there's nothing over there. Now I want to go ahead and add something in the controller or create a new controller, but I'm not going to do that because if you're doing outside in TDD, you tested your integration test over here, but now you need to start doing unit testing. In order to do unit test or in order to write your new controller, I'm going to go ahead and um, create a controller called your controller, let's say. And I'm sorry uh, for not specifying the problem statement. This is really a, just a simple leap year kata, but over a uh, controller. So I'm going to, to my uh, endpoint, I'm going to send a number and then the endpoint should return that, hey, this is a leap year or not, right? So I'm going to say year controller should, uh, we have a habit of using should as a, uh, as a, uh, as a word at the end of the class that we are going to test. So of course we are going to test year controller over here and then, not wasting time again, feel free to stop me, but I'm going to go ahead and kind of simply inject this code over here. We are writing a simple test that says should return leap. I actually, I should not even write should over here, but what we are saying is that uh, year controller should return leap if year is divisible by 400. So leap should be true. Um, there is no year controller. If I were typing code at this point of time, I would have just stopped at this point. And I would have said, hey, why don't we go ahead and create a class in my productions, the production packages, which is called your controller, right? Um, so here I'm just doing a simple TDD demo. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. Now we're just almost done. I'm going to create the, the method. Um, I really love this fact I to, to kind of create a like, like configure the automatically generated function so that it has this one line of unsupported operations. So if I go back to my, or if I run, let me just go ahead and run all the test cases now. If I go ahead and run all my test cases, now it constantly tells me where do I need to focus, right? If I had multiple of these uh, in a constructor maybe and over here, I know where I have to go and what I have to fix. I'll come over here. I'm going to hard code this right now because there's just one test case. Nothing else has to happen here. Response here is equal to new year. I really don't need to do anything here. And Now I kept some of the POJOs in place because really this is not about the TDD part that we are doing. The reason I kept the POJO, we want to save time over here. So response here is a very simple POJO that I've already created. Uh, I'm going to run my test cases again. And there we go. So now we know that, hey, my logic is working. That's amazing, right? But what's not working is that Still, our server, our endpoint is not working. Our network detail or integration detail is not working. And that's exactly what we want to know. This is the level of feedback that we want. First, we got the level of feedback inside the JVM that, hey, this logic seems to be working. That's cool. Let's move on. And what's not working is now our integration test. Uh, and I know why it is not working, right? Because this class is still just a simple class. It doesn't really say that it's a controller. So we have to tell our system that, hey, this is a controller. We should be able to go in and kind of talk to it on this endpoint. And it's going to have one get method, which will take uh, the year as a 
URI parameter, right? So here we are, and let's see if it works or not. And it does, perfect. So now what I'm going to do is this, this kind of signifies, right, that we do this multiple times. We, our integration test is there. We don't do a lot of kind of uh, uh, changes. I mean, we don't, unless we really need, we are in a habit or we are slowly starting a habit that not to write all the scenario in the integration test. It actually is testing the network layer. If we wanted like network layer behavior over here, which means if I send minus one and the response, HTTP response should be 500, I would write a test case for over here, but I would not write test case for 4,000, 8,000, 1996, all of those test cases will go right over here. Oops, right over here. So I have created those test cases. We have two options over here, either, let me go ahead and what I'm gonna do is just walk through as opposed to typing. Uh, So let's see, uh, not the best code I have written, but it, it's uh, a simple leap year calculator sort of a thing. We have a uh, few test cases right over here. So these are the three test cases, one for 4,000, 1,800, and 2000, 2016. Uh, we have our integration test. I'm going to go ahead and run that now. And it's working. So I think what I wanted to indicate was that one level of discipline that you can bring in is by working in a practice or discipline like this, where you're writing integration tests and tests together. It worked on my machine, but hey, works on my machine is considered a big joke, right? So working on my machine is not important. It has to work everywhere else. So what I did was as I moved from one branch to the other, this new branch had a Git workflow, right? Uh, again, be it GitHub, be it Bitbucket, all of them. And actually, I like some of the some of the the source code management systems have groovy pipelines. I could literally write code. Uh, unless you really love YAML, here it is. Um, kind of indenting those, right? So we have those over here. And really, all I have done over it has few steps. Mainly, it is caching stuff. But the most important step is, oops, do you see the word build right here, right? So what we are doing is, and I think even using a build system like Gradle is a good decision in itself, right? Being, be it Gradle, Maven, NPM, uh, the idea is that it comes with its own wrapper. So now we, when we push it on the CI CD pipeline, right? Where we have a uh, uh, Docker image, it will download your Gradle W uh, wrapper and run it, and then it will publish the test cases as well. So while we were doing this, let me go ahead and uh, change something so that I can push this. Uh, the test cases are working, and I'm going to go ahead and push it. Right, so here we go. Now, as we push it, I think what we wanted to really see was this, that, hey, is our actions, does it actually start a build? Does it start running your test cases? Does it publish the results? So in a way, what you want to do is uh, you want to start using your source control management system, not just as a storage system, but also a gatekeeper. Now, this is something where you can fail fast. You want to fail fast. And I think that reminds me uh, of a story that we can talk about a little bit later. But I think this is a good time check and a good uh, uh, break. I mean, if anyone has any questions or especially, Victor, do you think we're going all right? Should we keep moving on? Any questions so far? No, it's cool. I see you're using Micronauts. So interesting. Okay. Yeah. Quite new over there. Yeah, we, no, I love it. 
I also love the shoot the convention with the naming, but I found to kind of freak out some newcomers to the team. They are having a reflex to search for the test suffix. But yeah, this can be learned yes. easy, right? Uh, and yeah, and this actually, is... uh, thank you. I, I think our next topic about Sonar Cube is going to kind of it. It this is the first Sonar Cube's first error is that it's a test. It should end with a certain regular expression, and it's not should, right? So it's one of the errors that you get when you're using Sonar. Um, uh, and that's a good transition, right? So uh, thanks a lot for saying this, uh, Victor. We, what we talked about right now is tests. Then we talked about putting them on our build system. And then we executed them in our build system. Then we see if it is, hey, is it going to publish the results or not? We'll see if, yep, here we go. And we have the results. We have five tests, zero are failing, everything's passing. So that's cool, right? So mm -hmm. now uh, this would have failed if test cases were failing like this one right, or this one. So uh, uh, we kind of created a quality gate, but really, is that quality gate enough? Do you really think that if I say this is the behavior, and then I say, okay, I'm writing code to kind of fulfill that behavior, then that means the code quality or maintainability or, or other aspects of the software are taken care of? Uh, not necessarily true, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and what, what I'll do is I'll switch to uh, the next step. And I have intentionally gone ahead and added some bad code over here, right? Now, if I if you look at this code, or something's wrong with my tests over here, maybe not. Well, if you look at this code over here, and let me try see running my test cases. They seem to be working. So did my test cases stop crappy code? Uh, from going into my source control? No, it did not. And you need something to be there, right? So what I'll do is, while we talk about it, I'm going to go ahead yeah, and kind of... I want to add the thing. If people are so disciplined as to use outside the NTDD, they likely... They will not do this. Exactly. Never, ever. I would meet someone doing writing. So you put, have had a very strong, let's say, demand to TDD, outside NTDD, that already... Raise the bar. That's it. Actually, you won't believe it. One thing that I said was that when you're growing and it's it's somewhere that will come in the conclusion that what you do when you are growing is hire a lot of people. And a lot of problems actually start as you hire people. It's not necessarily three people who started the company. It's the 30 that follows. And that's when you need all these system in there, right? And see, I, this also I talk about a lot that you know, in the world of software, we say it depends. And it depends is an answer that can only come if you're extremely smart. It's not actually a getaway answer that, hey, it depends. If it depends, has to follow with a good answer. So uh, a lot of time you have to introduce these frameworks for these other newer people who will take some time to get used to it. And then you're all set. You're right. You know, so, so I think that... Uh, Anyways, moving on. So, so we have this issue over here. I'm going to, let me first quickly see if I have what I need. Anyway, so go ahead. Well, that lint was, 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 was uh, yeah? <laughs> telling me not to do it. Yeah, telling me not to do it. Yeah, but uh, thanks a lot, Victor. Yeah, I think that's even faster feedback. But I wanted to go ahead and you know talk about this as we so so what I did uh, using my macro. Let me go ahead and uh, hide this area. Uh, we know, right? We already created a build. Step, but I changed it to build and scan. What I want to do is, hey, 
there's some secrets over here which are coming from GitHub. Uh, it it kind of connects it with with the project on Sonar Cube, and uh, then we have some of the scanning settings. So it it kind of scans our uh, code right over somewhere right over. Uh, hmm, interesting. I hope it does what it does. Yeah, right here. So we have our build and right after the build, it runs the sonar and then it kind of uh, sends it to the sonar server. Now for the people who do not know uh, what it is, I'm, again, I'm trying to move this view from here to on the side. Anyway, so for the people who do not know, sonar is a well-known, uh, sonar is a well-known, uh, static code analysis system, right? And uh, what you're doing is you want other uh, issues to be highlighted when you're writing code, which are outside of your your tests that you wrote yourself, right? So I think this is like conflict of interest. You're checking your own books. Let's say if you're doing accounting. So you're also having like third eye, having your books double check. And, and that's what we are trying to do over here. And what is the reason that we do something like this, right? So... Uh, this is where uh, shifting quality, quality to the left comes into the picture, right? You want your your scans and quality issues to be caught as soon as possible. And this comes again from Toyota's lean production system, where you would imagine a sort of a assembly line where a car is coming and being built. And imagine before Toyota, there were these other companies which were building cars as well. But they would test it at the end when the car is ready, right? In like a like a garage. And when they test it, if something's wrong, the car stays there. Then they figure out why it happened. It takes them so much time. So this is a lot like the wrong definition of time that we talk about. But when Toyota came, what they did was the person who's working on the assembly line would actually test work of the previous person who was working as well. So while this is happening, if that person saw an issue, they would stop the assembly line. Then they would say, hey, a car, like a part came over here, doesn't meet the quality, what's wrong? So I think failing fast, once again, we want to do the exact same thing over here. Think of the assembly line as where, where our code is flowing from, from being written on our ID all the way to being released, right? And this is one, one quality uh, gate, so to speak, that we have, right? And actually Sonar calls it a quality gate. Let me uh, show you and uh, it's it's adding it over here but I have struts also open here it is right so I have what I did is struts seems to be one of the open source project which is being scanned over here and it shows all the different bugs it has some 417 issues you, you see all of those over here right so you can see all your issues over here now let's see if if uh, actually our, oops and it failed. Let's hope that it failed for the reasons that we thought of. And yep, see, it says it failed. Why? Because there is a bug. Let's see what bug did we end up introducing. Ah, there's something with the equal sign over here. And that's why, so that's what we wanted, right? We wanted things to fail at some point of time and not when there's a real issue that the production, uh, that you find in production. Victor, you seem to have a comment over here. Do you have yeah, anything? You know, you know what's my, I would like to add something on this. Sonar is the most important uh, factor that teaches people about decent coding practices and clean code today, besides code reviews. But it's something you really must have in any project without Sonar. You don't can't survive. You are automating the learning of clean code, basically. No, exactly. Actually, and thanks a lot for bringing that. Because I really believe, Victor, that based on which kind of age of project, like are you a new gen software developer or someone who has worked on five, 10 or 15 years old code, right? I have seen that it's a, every company, you can look at the age of it and pretty much predict how their pipeline is going to look like. So Sonar today has become part of, I mean, part and parcel of the, how everyone works. But you look at source code or, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, release pipelines of 10 year old 
uh, source code or five-year-old source code. A lot of them don't have Sonar still. Those companies are still working as if they were frozen in time. So I think uh, uh, you need deliberate effort to move forward. And that reminds me uh, one more thing that I had read in Software Crafts Person by Sandro, right? And it says, uh, one year of experience 10 times is not 10 years of experience. There's just one year of experience 10 times. So a lot of them still do it. So some of these things may be missing. Uh, you're right in in, in uh, newer projects, newer uh, places, newer products, they, it's almost a de facto standard, right? Um, now I see that we have, this is 10 or six. So let's see how much time we have. Uh, but we did see, hey, we added a issue and we kind of, found it before it kind of goes uh, in, in production. I'm going to go ahead and so what we saw over here so far, we are talking about failing fast. We failed, we created a build, we automated the build, and then we wrote test cases. Test cases were being executed locally. Now they were being executed on GitHub. We're trying to create as many quality gates as possible. Now there's a quality gate at Sonar. So that's breaking. So we, we kind of now have a third eye and I don't know what happens after GPT-3 starts scanning your code as well, right? And uh, so so future is bright on that side. Uh, and and so that happened. So we got a third third person or third third virtual person looking into our code and giving us code review tips. And now what's the next step, right? So the next step would be why not deploy it, right? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch to step three. It's the same code I, on the way also somewhere, I, I kind of uh, refactored it a little bit. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and change the deployment pipeline once again. And it had all the sonar related and test related things earlier, but now we added a few more features. What do you want to do? So a build pipeline that does not create artifacts at the end of the build is quite useless, right? You want to be able to say, hey, this is my version one, two, three, four. These are my artifacts over here. We are creating Docker uh, images. So here is our Docker. What we are doing is we are trying to log in to Docker. Then we are trying to do Docker push. We are using a Gradle plugin to do a Docker push. So it gets pushed over there. Then we sign into Azure CLI. And after that, we kind of, use Azure command to push the entire image, right? Now I'm gonna go ahead and why not just push this while it kind of deploys, right? Um, so why do this right now? I, I don't know if you have seen this, a lot of companies are not all, so have you seen like banks? are software companies nowadays, right? Banks uh, or a taxi service is a software company nowadays, right? And when they're working, uh, uh, companies which are not software development, totally product companies, a lot of time they they do all of it. And but the last extra mile, last mile, last connectivity may be missing, right? And I, I specifically ended up saying, I, I, I don't hold anything against banks. Uh, but I know a trading software, I don't know, Victor, you or anyone in the the right uh, the audience has heard about yeah, Knights Capital. They Knights are not Capital. known for, for very good quality. Yes. <laughs> so there, there was a company called Knights Capital who would do uh, high frequency trading on Wall Street. And uh, it's known that they had like a couple of servers, let's say 10 or five servers, I don't know, and someone manually upgraded. Uh, four servers and not one. So fifth server was not upgraded. That file didn't drop in over there. The next days, one thing led to other, and I think it automatically traded around a billion dollar or more than a billion dollars worth of stock. At the end of the day, they made loss of 400 plus million dollars. They could never recover from, from the uh, losses and they were taken over by a rival. So a rival company kind of took that company over with the losses. So, uh, and it seems very small, right? Hey, it's just this one file, configuration file. I'm just going to go ahead and change that, or I'm just going to change the database connection. We've seen so many times, uh, you know, some manual configuration doesn't happen. And this, this production system that's supposed to kind of connect to a production database connects to a test database or other way around. And things like those go wrong. 
and we are not talking about some made up story these are real things and they are not old stories so i don't know if you heard about january 11 right just a month back a little bit about a month back uh, there were no flights flying in the united states again someone tried to do a manual change in a file and something went wrong and uh, faa's flight alerting system was not working for a couple of hours so no flights in the states right so the real consequences of uh, of doing this uh, and sometimes we we kind of uh, uh, should take that extra discipline and practice to make this sure as well and this i'm saying we do it from day one so i there's there's a, we, i think audience can go ahead and read something called walking skeleton right when we start we start with a walking skeleton and do everything rather than just thinking about the new features and make that whole connectivity available for developers to work on i commit something i can see it on a server in a few minutes right um that being said let's have a look at what happened did are we done with our build we had pushed one with deployment but let's assume that it will deploy i'm quite confident i've done it three times today so <laughs> it should deploy uh, and and that being said maybe we can move on uh, a little bit right so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to just go to my main branch and talk a little bit about uh, this over here so one of the biggest problem when people are working with business so there's developers and what we call business right or product analysts or project managers they're continuously thinking of the value proposition like hey get me a integration with octa let's say or that's actually the most technical thing that one can say from the business side but more like create a dashboard to do something or make a screen where i can enter data when you are saying this these are all functional requirements what they are not talking about is non functional requirements right what are non functional requirements so things that they are not saying but they are expecting so they are expecting that when i click on the submit button it should respond back in a second or so right when i get the sign in screen when i hit enter on my browser i should be able to see that screen in in a couple of seconds correct so those are my non functional requirements and uh, there were times when developers only did kind of programming and nothing else but after the devops culture set in i think the teams becoming started becoming more and more cross functional and because of that these teams now have uh, kind of uh, have roles like site reliability engineers right uh, and they actually take this one step forward they define something called slos which are service level objectives so they are not just thinking of my screen whether it shows me the data or not but they are also thinking hey if i am an api business do i want this kind of slo service level objective that 95% of my response time must be below 500 milliseconds or of all the http calls i make http errors must be less than 1% right so these are some of the slos that sres or the development teams and they're so nice nowadays performance testing you don't have to do in different tools and jmeter this is a there's a very nice tool called k6 that we are using where you can write it in typescript right so we wrote like this small thing that i i write over here i'm going to make a small change over here let's see what happens but um what i'm doing is i took 10 minutes to create this test case that says hey create 10 virtual users hit this url uh so many times and at 0 0.5 right so what we want to do is we want to kind of keep hitting this url sleep point five and there'll be 10 and you do it for one minute and uh 10 virtual users and sleep for 0.5 seconds between the requests right and while you are doing all of this i want to make sure that my http error rate remains less than one percent and this is now what i could have actually done while we were talking i could have deployed it right uh, what I did was I used a cloud version. So let's see how I did it, right? So I added a simple, again, one more workflow in my GitHub that simply says that, hey, this workflow should run after a completion of my 
previous workflow, which was my Java CI/CD, which is just making the build tests. If everything works, then you move on and and do this. Uh, this is simply saying that hey, use the the K6 plugin on success and here is my javascript file that needs to be executed and then i said it let's push all my results to k6 cloud right so all my results are also now going to the k6 cloud and uh, this is the file so uh, that's about it so we released something so we now just imagine where we have gone right we, have, we were thinking just a few minutes back hey am i getting a compilation error and feedback or not now we are deploying something on the fly then running a test case and saying hey are my slos meeting or not and this i can quite confidently say that can you can do it in first couple of days itself when you're you're starting a project if you were modernizing a system it may take you more time but i think this is at least something that we should do when you release the product i think you owe it to the users that you check the performance right so you you do that over here and uh, let's see if uh, i think it's going to take a couple of more minutes it's running the test cases right here what i can do is as it is doing docker push and deploying it let me go ahead and show you a couple of older uh tests that i have executed with right and wrong urls right and um, if you look at it this dashboard can see you show you and i i love the fact about uh how these tools work the fact that it has dashboards you suddenly made it business friendly you can show it to your vice president or a ceo and say hey look at our thresholds right exactly so here here you go 95 percent uh more than 95 percent uh, uh requests are under the given time and there's less than 0 0.01 one uh, percent requests are actually failing so uh you can catch that or if there was an error, you can catch that. Hey, you just broke something. All your HTTP requests are failing, right? Happens. Sometimes you change the controller. This is another issue, right? You change a controller. This is a good one, actually. And this is something that you want to catch again sooner than later. What if I change something over here? It's in a string, right? All of the things will start failing. So, uh, here you go, catching it early, failing fast. And uh, that leads me to our next thing. Do you really think that our job of getting feedback is only when you release something? No, right? So you want to constantly keep getting feedback, even when your users are using the system, even when you are asleep, most probably, right? So what do you do? In this case, we decided to use app insights again not promoting a tool over here it's like new relic or elk suites uh, apm uh, or app dynamics right so azure has that it was handy we used it over here and as soon as you do that what you start getting is data inside the application as well and let me explain you what we mean by inside the application right so there's always when you use the cloud and when you use it right this is my instance that is running and it's telling me about my cpu it's telling me about the memory it's using network but what we call this is black box monitoring black box monitoring means it's just telling me that hey what's the where's, where's the cpu stand or where does the memory stand right it doesn't tell us anything about what's really happening and i think that's when you use something like app, app insights or or uh, elk Please, right and we created this is the default dashboard that we have let's see if our it's if our uh, load tests are executing or not not yet i think these are the older ones yep one hour ago so not yet but if they were running i think you would have you'd see more kind of HTTP requests, server response time, all of this data you're getting over here. So the SLO that you had defined, you want to make sure that your service level objectives are not just meeting when you're testing, they should meet in production as well, right? So now you take time to create alerts over here and then you start getting your SLO. So I think that a user shouldn't have to tell you that the service has degraded. You should figure it out before it actually degrades right so you figure it out 
and you start fixing it even before your users know. And this is one way of doing it. So I think this is what I wanted to talk about that this, this is an end to end. Uh, uh, we want to kind of end to end uh, feedback that we want to get. And right, so growing fast doesn't necessarily mean coding fast, but it's sustaining your pace of delivery, right? Beyond the first few months, you want to continuously do it. In a, and of course, this discussion is quite useless if you're writing a, a script that you're going to use five times and really throw it, right? But if you're writing a software that's going to live longer and other people are going to use it, then I think you want to sustain your pace. You want to continuously keep giving your users new features and new things, right? So uh, that happens. And Victor, here is my note bullet point that says, if you do this, onboarding new engineers will be much easier as well because you have these quality gates right in there. Um, getting your features in your user's hand will be much faster as well. So if you think about it, we're talking about accelerate matrix right now. You're talking about reducing the lead time to delivery. You will, you'll be able to write something and you'll be able to release it faster, right? Um, you'll be able to fix issues much faster than before right um because your users may not be finding many of them but if they're finding your lead time is much shorter so you'll be able to fix it and release it also faster and uh, this way you'll be responding to your customers needs much faster so you're you're you, you're bound to have happier customers and we can say it from our own incubates experience victor that uh the kind of emails that we get is not the kind of emails that you would actually a software services company would get right so uh they see how fast we are moving when they're working with other software vendors who takes months for you know softwares to be released um and i think that's that with that i would like to conclude my talk and we are just in time yes wow <laughs> unlike <laughs> me you are you were in time very good <laughs> Very good. Um, so basically, the la this last point, maybe this can get even more fine grained, right? Like collecting internal metrics from oh, yes. like, mic like micrometer and stuff like in yes, code. This is, this is actually using micrometer. I haven't kind of jumped in here, but uh, yes, mm -hmm. it can. You can actually do uh, integration. I, I'm not able to go in right now. For example, um, more the response times of third party APIs that you call or monitor the oh, yes. delicate method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And SQL queries. So you could find out which queries are taking much more time than any other. So yes. Uh, and I love New Relic for that matter. New Relic is really amazing. The kind of detail that it can give for like at least Java code that we have seen is is really good. And again, the, the we didn't want to just talk about Java. You should do this no matter which technology you're using. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, yes, Datadog, Dynatrace, <laughs> there are many names here. Um, one one note here. Um, there were in the, there was someone in the chat um, asking about Sonar Lint, the plugin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could, you, could you go back to code just a second? If you have that bad code around somewhere to, to show the yeah. guys, to show yes, the folks. Yes, yes. Because yeah, you can reduce this, the feedback loop even 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 more if you even have shorter. It. Yes. Yet. The, the, the tricky part is finding the branch or the code ah there yeah mm -hmm. and you can do command shift s and right here you you find command shift s and all your and if you right change yeah. anything in that line and commit it please do the do the folks a good change anything in there and try to commit again just try don't actually commit it. sonar plane right we're oh, kicking yeah, yeah yeah so so yes it will so let, let me right now just do a, a kind of Hmm, yeah, just anything. Commit? Yeah. So, so now it will even show like issues. Yeah, there, there, this one. Yeah. there you go. Yeah. And if you say, so basically they are warning you that, you're, that, you're, that uh, you will be laughed at. Uh, sorry, that uh, someone else will say, hey, what the heck? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. One last chance to do repent refactoring. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. But let me also tell you, I mean, Sonar Lint can give you bad issues like things that you false shouldn't positive. false positive yeah false yeah. positive a lot of them so you have to, it's a it's a long journey you have to kind of fine tune it based on your way of working as well a little bit and then i think people should not use it any system is as good as how easily can you kind of circumvent or escape it 
So I see, I don't know if you know this. So first of all, Sona should not do it, but if you do int, I don't know, i is equal to zero, it may actually say, let me see, uh, this is a magic, actually for zero, it may not say magic number. Yes, I see, I, I saw it in my projects. Uh, repeating a, a space, for example, between quotes in three power or seven places in the in the file will say, hey, constant, no. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No. Uh, so uh, use the judgment, uh, yeah. It, 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 no, so I'm saying it's, this is, people would do something like this, 1987, right? And, uh, or even, you know, now I don't think so, uh, you necessarily have to kind of, uh, what do I, let me just make it float, right? If a value of uh, pi, it's so well known that I don't necessarily know if I want to use the word pi every time. And maybe I want to use the word 3.14. It's it's well-known value. But not only that, what people started doing, so I've seen something like this where you'd have number 198 and uh, Sonar would kind of complain that, hey, 198 is a magic number. And they would like literally do one, 98, nine, <laughs> eight, and then That's store it and then use that variable, right? So post and space equals space, wow. Space, yes, exactly, right? So, that's, um, yeah. That's when ha that's, what happens if you blindly follow a tool. So always follow your judgment first, of course. Right? Actually, and let, so that's what I was talking about. You know, it depends answer. And that also, I'm heavily influenced by Toyota's lean management system, right? Lean uh, production system. And it talks about something called Shu Hari. So it's like a framework. So when you come in, Shu is when you can follow something well. Ha is when you can master it. And re is the final stage when you can redefine the rules. You can like literally change the rules. You can talk about the rules. You can have a debate about it. So that's that's how you kind of kind of uh, climb up the ladder. Uh, if you stayed always at the shoe, this is what you'll end up doing. Because you're not improving, and you create a variable called one nine. Uh, but this is the time when if if you have become uh, more mature, you may actually go to Sonar and disable that rule for that matter. So you imitate, you master, you challenge. And the same with clean code, the same with TDD, the same with everything. You first imitate until you master it, and then master. you start thinking about the, the rules, yes. There are some ideas in the in the chat more. Um, when you talked about Sonar, Sonar Cube on the pipeline, there were multiple, I mean, uh, the discussion went about security vulnerability scanning tools like sneak or like uh, what was the key uh, someone proposes another name uh and uh these are also Snike. Fun. Snike, Snike, yeah. right? yes was, yes you know, we actually we use that too um and it, it really sometimes depends on what kind of business you are in so uh right uh a lot of people are actually creating a software that runs only inside a vpn and sometimes they don't care as much uh, a lot of people are creating public APIs and it has to be, I, I like even the open source version of Snike would go ahead and at least check your Docker files and see if there are any vulnerabilities or not. We do a lot of this. So we also use uh, J dependency or something that shows all the CVEs, right? All the vulnerabilities which are not in the dependencies of your no, uh, all and Snike. J it shows this right intellij recently started just recently several months ago started showing vulnerabilities to our despair in our poem <laughs> like oh it's all yeah. yellow yes, yes. <laughs> exactly it's exactly. Very so, yep it monitors sql query by default or some interceptors are needed um so it is thanks a lot for asking that question it's a little bit more involved and as i kind of uh I did a lot of magic while switching from different uh, uh, screens, but let me see if I can. Uh... Um... So what we did, and almost all the different technologies requires you to use some kind of a Java agent. And uh, here is my Java agent. So this is where the magic is happening. You are on the, yeah, go ahead. 
Yes, just pause for two seconds, sorry. Someone asked if you need any kind of interceptors to monitor SQL queries. This is the one, right? Yes, I think this Java, yes. So I, I'm assuming that when we say monitor the SQL queries, we are talking about App Insights or New Relic or any tool that you're using, right? Uh, you can, no matter which tool you're using, they are going to tell you to add a Java agent. So I think after JDK 1.4 or 1.6, they came up with this runtime byte uh, byte code uh, uh, editing, right? So uh, you could on the fly add a jar file like this, which edits the, the byte code on the fly. And based on that, you get the data. So yes, this is this is how we have done it. Most other cases also, you have to attach a Java agent as you run your process. And this, uh, let's see if we have a, what it does is it, because of that, it creates the entry point of the Docker file now has a Java agent when you start your application. So here is the Java agent and that starts then capturing and sending data to, to Azure App Insights in this case. Or a JDBC proxy without an agent, yeah? So basically this Java agent spices up your code to measure known parts that can cause performance issues like GDBC, networking, everything, everything. everything. Yes, yes. Long time back, we used to actually had to instrument our code. I don't know if you knew, there's, there's something called instrumentation. So you'd yeah, actually yeah. create a byte code and then you'll, it'll be a two-step process. Now you do yeah. it on the field. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Cool, very cool. A very cool, very cool discussion. And it, I hope it opens our eyes more about the whole pipeline. I mean, they're trying to, and I love this talk because it, the focus of the this, of the, the event on, the, on, my, on our, my community were until this one, uh, more most on code and code only and refactoring. And in the end, that's where the starting, the magic starts to happen. But soon you realize that you're actually solving a problem, not just code, not just uh, work for uh, code for, for food. And you start solving solutions, not just shipping code. Interesting. Very, very well, uh, very good perspective you brought over here. Nice. And nice overview of all the moving parts involved in all this, uh, this journey. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Victor. And I think uh, this is also an effort to kind of propose that a lot of developers kind of think not my job. Uh, yeah. Right? Right. I think yeah. so. Uh, it is our job, right? Being a good software craftsperson means doing this. And you want to get fired by chat GPT. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. More on the problem than yeah. Setting up the walking skeleton, I think that's the most fun part for me, like setting up all those integrations at the beginning and seeing the long-term benefits. That's just like cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Folks, thank you so much for the effort. Nice effect to the beginning. I was, wow, he did those videos. That video has slides on it. <laughs> what was that? Amazing job. Thank you for thank you for all the effort and all the preparation. I you worked a lot hard for this. And uh, thank you for the time. It it's what 10 and a half or <laughs> it's late. 30. Too late. Thank you so much, Victor. Right. Appreciate no. it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we are going to launch our incubates uh, channel on YouTube. I hope uh, people will find us on YouTube and follow us. Subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And uh, all right. did you you told me something about the plan to start something in Romania. Am I wrong? Yes, we want to. We want to hire in Romania. Uh, I would really love for people to apply. Send us an email. My email is sapan at incubite.co. Uh, you can get in touch with us on Twitter uh, or just best way is go to our website and they'll find a careers web page and there's an email address over there. Please shoot an email. Uh, we're trying to find. Hiring. But they are hiring. hiring. Yes, <laughs> hiring. We didn't, I didn't create a slide for that. We are hiring. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Good. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank bye, you bye. Guys. bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.